In this video, we're going to be discussing how some bishops and archbishops explain how God got it wrong on human sexuality. I'm just going to play you three clips, all from bishops and archbishops of the Church of England, Sarah Mahali, Stephen Contrell, and Justin Webley, as they explain how God is somehow changed his mind on the area of human sexuality. Let's give them a listen. Together the bishops have studied the scriptures, we have paid attention to the church tradition, and we have listened to wider society, as well as the voices of our sister churches in the Anglican Communion and our ecumenical partners. Above all, we have sought the wisdom of the Holy Spirit in prayer and worship. The differences uh, within the Church of England are also present among the bishops of the Church of England. Engaging with living in love and faith pro uh, process has enabled us to become more open and honest with each other. That has been an important part of the process, which means, uh, and, and I think has given us a greater understanding of what it means uh, to be living together as members of the body of Christ. We know that we need to change. And Archbishop Stephen will speak more on this shortly. shortly. In our letter, uh, because we, will, we write a letter to the church, we express our joyful affirmation and celebration of LGBTQI people in our church communities. And we have begun to produce a suite of prayers. These uh, prayers are known as prayers of love and faith. They mean that same-sex couples uh, who are faithful and seek a lifelong relationship will be able to come into churches in the Church of England for prayers of dedication, thanksgiving, and of God's blessing. Uh, after, for example, uh, coming to a significant point of their relationship or entering a civil partnership or marriage. The Church of England is in a new place, and, and I'm really pleased with the decisions we've made. So it means that... Um, once these prayers are formally commended later this year, that faithful, stable Christian couples in a civil marriage or a civil partnership can, if they wish, come to church and that you know, their love for each other in that relationship can be acknowledged, celebrated, and the couple can receive a blessing. That's never happened before. Mm. I'm pleased about that. Too many people, especially around sexuality, have heard the words of rejection that human tongues create. The Church of England has gone against its teachings that it's taught for hundreds of years on human sexuality. But there are many who are standing up and disagreeing, like Dr. Ian Paul. Let's give him a listen. Christians believe that God's best for us in terms of patterns of relationships is marriage as a lifelong union between one man and one woman. And in the end, do we change according to what the wills of people who don't come to church are, or do we actually stay faithful to the majority view of Christendom? And the reality is that it's the churches that hold on to this consensus historic view. These are the ones that are growing, these are the ones that are attracting young people, and these are the ones that really are making an impact on the society around them. Sarah Mahali says, They've listened to the scriptures. They've listened to tradition. They've listened to the Holy Spirit. They have worshipped. But I'm going to say they have not listened to the scriptures. They have not listened to church tradition. They have not listened to the Holy Spirit. They have not worshipped in spirit and truth. They did listen to the world around them. They did listen to Anglican churches, for instance, like the ones in Canada and the United States, to come to this conclusion. The scriptures flat out do not affirm same-sex union. Jesus never affirmed same-sex union. But instead of me explaining all that to you, I thought I would allow you to hear Calvin Robinson, an eloquent speaking priest, defend the biblical position of which he gets cussed at even here in this short clip. So thanks for watching and God bless. Well, we are up against the authorities. Three bishops from the established church. That means either I am wrong 
and Christians have been teaching incorrectly for the last 2,000 years, or, and Jews and Christians for the last four to 6,000 years, or we have church leaders attempting to drag the church into apostasy. Neither way is good. The consequences are severe. This debate is not just happening in this chamber. This debate is happening in real time in the House of Bishops as we speak. There's a growing number of vocal bishops who want to change the, ter- the church's teaching on marriage. The result being the spiritual neglect of Anglicans up and down this country. So let's consult people wiser than myself, starting with the church fa- fathers. St. Thomas Aquinas, in his Summer Theologica, quite clearly identifies matrimony as being between one man and one woman, beneficial for begetting of children and for the good of offspring for both educational and developmental purposes, necessary for the perfection of the community and for the worship of God. St. Paul describes marriage as, therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife and they become one flesh in which he is mirroring the language of Genesis, where God tells man and woman to be fruitful and multiply. Both Aquinas and Paul refer to matrimony as a sacrament, a holy mystery in which one man and one woman are joined together in conjugal union with the potential to be blessed by the grace of God with children, to start a family for the worship of God. People will often argue in this debate, we know more about homosexuality now than we did then. Maybe so. But are we really going to suggest that God knew less then than we know now? For either all of Scripture is God-breathed, or it isn't. Either we believe Christ, or we don't. So let's refer to another source, the Book of Common Prayer, one of the Anglican formularies, an authority of liturgy and catechism in the Anglican Church. The prayer book lists three ordained reasons for matrimony. First, it was ordained for the procreation of children, to be brought up in the fear and nature of the Lord and to praise his holy name. Second, it was ordained for a remedy against sin and to avoid fornication, that such persons as have not the gift of constancy might marry and keep themselves undefiled members of the church's body. And thirdly, it was ordained for the mutual society help and comfort that one ought to have the other, both in prosperity and adversity. So are we looking to alter the catechism of just the Anglican Church or the Catholic Church too? Should should they all get with the times? 2,000 years of Christian doctrine cannot be altered at the whim of a few liberal bishops. What is God-ordained cannot be adjusted to suit our new liberal progressive views. Marriage is heterosexual and monogamous and should be open to the possibility of children. The Bible backs all of this up. It's very clear throughout on this matter whether it's nine verses or 32,000 verses, marriage is between one man and one woman for the purposes of procreation. Sex outside of marriage is a sin, and that is the same for heterosexuals as it is for homosexuals, although the Bible is quite clear that same-sex relations are abhorrent. And before some smart Alec starts ask, asking me the question of whether I'm wearing mixed fabrics, there is a difference between the moral laws and ceremonial laws, and Christ did come to fulfill the old laws. Both the issues of marriage and homosexuality, however, are still addressed in the New Testament, in Paul's epistles, but also in the Gospels. Jesus does talk of marriage in Mark and Matthew, both in the context of heterosexual union. So my question to the bishops would be, do we not believe in the authority of scriptures anymore? Can we pick and choose which parts of the gospel we adhere to? The church, after all, is Christ's bride, as we heard earlier. Jesus is described as the bridegroom, so that we may know how he relates to us. Two grooms would be pointless. Christ is already in union with the Father and the Holy Spirit. It's us he's inviting in. Two brides is what we're looking at here. The church is attempting to marry itself and to leave Christ out of the picture. We are directly talking about undermining God's plan as he has revealed it to us. We're replacing his authority with our own. If marriage is no longer between one man and one woman, are we open to the idea of polygamy? We disregard the heterosexual aspect, so why not the monogamous aspect too? If love is love, as we keep hearing, who is to say that three men loving each other is not more love than two men loving each other? And I'm sure someone in this chamber has echoed the words love is love tonight, and this is not about love being love. This is about marriage, the sacrament of holy matrimony. It is directly connected to love, but it's not the definition of love. 
Too many people utter those words and confuse the meaning of love. Agape, the biblical context of love, is a divine love. It's a sacrificial love. It's not lustful. People often conflate sex with love. It's very disingenuous. We've heard quite a bit of that. But then, of course, atheists often pirate the words, God is love, and we've heard that one tonight too. Again, without any understanding. Yes, God is love. But he sets the terms, not us. Another one we've heard plenty of is inclusivity. Should the church be more inclusive? Again, it's a play of words. It's, it's virtue signaling. It's to appear good rather than to be good. The church should absolutely be inclusive. Christ spent time with tax collectors and prostitutes, but it is they who went away changed, not Christ. We are fallen, therefore we are all sinners. The church is open to sinners, of course it is. That's the purpose of the church. But it should not be to encourage people to continue to sin. Our duty as clerics is to help lead people to Christ, to lead them away from sin, not to embrace it, not to affirm it. I know many LGB people, I know many LGB people who live lives in Christ. They abstain from sexual gratification to be closer to God, and it's not easy, it really isn't. It's perhaps not fair, but it is right and it is good. And these people are being let down. I've had people crying, saying, I could have got married, but I did what the church taught me was right, and now the church is saying they were wrong all along. I've wasted my life. As Christians, we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. The trap that we're falling into in this debate is looking at the church through the eyes of the world rather than through his kingdom. And that's their prerogative. However, the faith is inherently discriminatory. God is discriminatory. He sets conditions on us entering his heavenly kingdom. It is not a free-for-all. We must turn away from sin, repent, and follow Christ. And I want to specify, it is the sin that is the problem, not the sinner. Every single person is loved by God, and God forgives all of us of our depravity. But we have to turn away from our sins and turn toward him. And it seems the panel opposite me has forgotten to separate the sin from the sinner. One can denounce sin while still welcoming the sinner. So as I wrap up, my message to the proposing side is do not lead us astray. Do not lead people astray. Do not be the wolves in sheep's clothing. Do not be the false teachers that the Bible warns us about. Remember your obligation to defend the faith. Stop teaching about diversity, inclusion, and equality and get back to teaching about redemption and salvation. This is spiritual neglect. Help people by telling them the truth. Be kind to people by supporting them through those struggles and reminding them that Christ suffers with them and be compassionate by leading them to Christ when the world tries to lead them away from him. You do not have the authority to bless sin. When I hear the Bishop of London on record saying these new prayers will mean priests can bless same-sex relationships, some of which may be sexual in nature, I hear the devil at work. Bishops are promoting the idea of sacramental sodomy. Let them be anathema. Repent. And to the rest of you, I have no doubt that some of you will consider me a bigot or a transphobe or a homophobe, but I am neither of those things, none of those things. I am simply a follower of Christ, a Christian. And we are naturally countercultural. And if so-called liberals were truly diverse and tolerant, they would embrace us just as they embrace everyone else. 